and how they are regulated. Hopefully it will be entertaining for you and I will try to simplify it as much as possible, but if you feel it's too shallow, just let me know and we can dive into details. So, uh, I'm representing now Sirius University. This is a new life science research center in the south of Russia uh, that was created just a couple of years ago and it's specialized actually in medicines development. Uh, it's an extension of a very interesting project when Olympic infrastructure of Winter Olympics in Sochi 2014 was transformed into the educational center for talented youth. And actually uh, this project is kind of similar to the event that is now being hosted here in Lisbon. That's why organizers asked me to come and, you know, represent this uh, uh, Russian Educational Center for Gifted Youth here at this wonderful conference. So coming back to developing medicines. Uh, well, uh, you know, human body is a very, very complex system. You know, there are, as you see, octillions of atoms, uh, trillions of cells and uh, billions of kilometers of DNA in our body and something is always going wrong there. So, uh, and it, we also live in a very, very dangerous world. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands or millions of bacteria attacking our body every moment, trying to take advantage of our body. And it's not surprising that uh, until recently, human beings didn't live long enough. So it may be a surprise for you, but just 150 years ago here in Europe, the average life expectancy was just below 35 years. And in many parts of the world, such as Africa and Asia, even a century ago, people lived on average shorter than 30 years. Uh, this dramatic increase in the life expectancy, of course, is due to many reasons. I mean, improvement of life standards, medicine in general, but it also coincides very well with development of a new science, the pharmaceutical science. So actually medicines have made a very great impact on how long do we live today and in the quality of our life. Of course, uh, from the inception of the human civilization, people, human beings tried to find remedies, life-saving remedies, remedies that improve the quality of their life. The first written artifacts of the use of natural medicines are dated back to ancient Egypt. And in Greece, and in uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there were hundreds of uh, very well described herbal medicines and medicines made from minerals used in everyday life. In Middle East, uh, Ibn Sina uh, discovered, uh, he wrote the first pharmaceutical handbook, and actually he discovered disinfection, a very breakthrough discovery that actually strong alcohol is much more uh, useful when it's used externally to disinfect wounds than internally. So, but it was only uh, medieval Europe where uh, medicines really appeared as the object of research. So it was Paracels, the famous uh, scientist, who actually made a guess that uh, it's not herbs in general that treat the human disease. These are chemicals that are inside the herbs. And if you made extracts, elixirs, uh, from natural uh, objects such as uh, herbs, you can prepare very well-defined drugs that can be used to treat a variety of diseases with more or less reproducible result. And then there were first pharmacies and first pharmaceutical factories. And actually in 1897, there was a birth of pharmaceutical science. The first synthetic drug was created, the acetyl salicylic acid, aspirin, made by German uh, company Bayer. And that was actually the birth of the modern pharmaceutical science. And then in the 20th century, there were, of course, breakthroughs. In uh, 1928, the British scientist Alexander Fleming have found a strange phenomena of interference between uh, growth of fungi and bacteria in the petri dishes where he cultivated these microorganisms. And he discovered penicillin, the first antibiotic that actually saved uh, hundreds of thousands of wounded soldiers during the World War II, actually having probably more impact on how the World War II evolved than many major battles of that uh, uh, huge war. And there was another miracle drug that actually uh, appeared during the World War II. Uh, it's called cortisone. It was discovered before the World War II as a hormone, 
Uh, but then allies actually intercepted multiple ships going from Latin America to Europe, carrying huge loads of bovine adrenal glands. And they found out that uh, Germans used the uh, cortisone to increase stamina of their fighter jet pilots to enable them to spend a lot of time in the air. And uh, uh, there was a huge project in the US actually uh, aimed at reproducing the technology of isolating this drug and giving them to American soldiers. The project has failed actually. It was only after the World War II when American pharmaceutical company Merck actually found a way to synthesize the cortisone. And it, they found out that cortisone actually is the uh, very effective drug in terms of reducing strong inflammation. Uh, this drug helps to overcome severe diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. And it was the first drug at, the, at those times which really made lives of patients with severe inflammatory diseases uh, much better, I mean, reducing the severe inflammation they had. But of course, there were not only breakthroughs, there were multiple failures as well. So the first uh, uh, very well-known failure was the story of uh, sulfanilamide, sulfanilamide, the drug that was uh, prepared by American pharmacy with a new formulation and given to multiple children with uh, flu. And the uh, pharmacist used the solvent, which was not used before, and he didn't actually care about testing the toxicity of that uh, formulation in animals. And as a result, over 100 uh, children died because of the toxicity of this product. And the pharmacist committed suicide, and as a result, there were first laws in the United States that actually governed how the uh, medicine should be studied to avoid such catastrophes in the future. Starting from that time, uh, all drugs that are now being approved in the market are undergoing very uh, extensive preclinical testing on lab animals to avoid such, such failures. And there was another uh, dramatic incident with the drug which is called talidomide. It was given in 50s to pregnant women who had morning sickness, nausea, uh, and actually it was considered a safe drug because lab tests in animals didn't show any toxicity. But the problem is that at that moment it was not necessary to test the drug on pregnant uh, animals. And it appeared that the drug leads actually to huge so-called embryo toxicity, anomalies in ch children that uh, were uh, born while their, women, while their mothers took this drug for uh, morning sickness. That was a huge uh, problem in Europe mostly. And after thalidomide tragedy, the laws for developing medicine became even uh, stricter. Nowadays, there is a very complicated codex of uh, laws, how drugs should be developed, how they should be tested. As you can see, in normal times, I mean, except the emergencies such as COVID-19 pandemics, uh, the drug development takes multiple years. It's actually 10 to 12 years. And there is multiple rounds of testing in lab animals, in patients uh, that actually guarantee that the drug is not only effective, but also safe for uh, those people uh, who are intended to be treated with this product. Nowadays, medicines, of course, are not only natural products. There are multiple drugs, multiple classes of drugs that are being used by medical doctors and developed by pharmaceutical companies. These are not only so-called small molecules that are made using chemical reactions. These are also recombinant proteins, and I would touch upon them in my presentation. Uh, proteins that, uh, molecules that resemble those uh, proteins that are in our body, but made through uh, biotechnology techniques. There are viral vectors which are used for gene therapy. These are artificial viruses that are genetically modified in such a way that they are able to compensate for particular genetic defect in the deficiency in the human body and treat, for example, uh, hereditary diseases. Of course, there are drugs that are based on RNA. These are mRNA vaccines, which made huge difference during the COVID-19 pandemics, and many, many others, which uh, we will not 
described in this short overview. And of course, pharmaceutical science right now is not only chemistry and biology. This is genetics, this is molecular and cell biology, biochemistry, a lot of uh, computational biology, bioinformatics is used in drug development these days. So actually, I mean, to have a good chances in pharmaceutical industry, you have to become probably well, a mathematician as well, because uh, these uh, bioinformatics methods are used almost universally in drug development right now, and mathematical modeling as well, to predict how the drug will behave in a human body. But it all starts with, uh, with a patient. So nowadays, uh, you don't kind of select some herb and try to use it in different patients, uh, trying to find out whom it may help. You actually start with the so-called unmet medical need, a disease that doesn't have any medicines uh, to treat with. And then you try to find, a bio biologist tries to find a target, some protein or gene that actually is responsible for this disease. And by uh, targeting this gene, uh, you may have a therapeutic effect on the, in the patient. And then you describe how this drug should look like, how it should behave, what characteristics this drug should have. You create so-called target product profile. And then you select, I mean, different approaches, how to reach that target, how to make a drug that will work safely and effectively in a given patient. Uh, we will start this overview with small molecule medicines. Those uh, synthetic uh, drugs that uh, were made 100 years ago, and they're still a backbone of most therapeutic regimens. So how do you find these uh, small molecule drugs? You can, well, as our insectors did, try to find natural compounds, try to identify what are those uh, molecules that actually make some herbs or leaves really beneficial for human health. So, and you can extract those uh, different molecules from the, uh, from the herbs and try to identify the structure of those compounds that are present there and select those of them who really have the therapeutic effect. A very good example of uh, development of such medicines from natural sources are cytotoxic drugs called paclitaxel and docetaxel. These are chemotherapy drugs that are used for chemotherapy of many malignancies, malignant diseases, malignant tumors right now, still. They are backbone of many chemotherapy regimens. And they were actually derived from the molecule that was extracted from the uh, thick uh, tree, I mean, a Chinese tree that was used for centuries by, uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, also for treatment of cancer. Of course, uh, there are other ways to develop these small, this small molecule drugs. You can prepare, you can use a huge libraries of known chemical compounds, libraries that contain hundreds of thousands or millions of different molecules. And then you, they use uh, very complicated robotic devices that actually screen those millions of different molecules against uh, a particular target or particular cellular model that uh, corresponds to the disease you want to treat. And then, if you are lucky, among those millions of molecules, you find the one that by chance have the desired effect on the target you want to, uh, you want to have. Uh, there are other uh, uh, ways to develop medicines, such as so-called fragment-based approach. This is the way, you know, when you try to fit different small building blocks of uh, molecules, you know, in a way it's similar to the Lego uh, uh, be, uh, constructor. So you try to fit different small fragments into a structure of the target, a protein that you want to block, and then when you find those blocks that fit your target very well, you prepare, you combine them into a single molecule and prepare a key to that uh, protein target that actually blocks it or opens it very, very well. And then uh, there is a virtual screening. So right now, bioinformatics, structural biology uh, are very advanced. So actually you can you know, prepare a model, a mathematical model that describes interaction of uh, your target protein with a small molecule. And you have uh, you know, millions, tens of millions of potential molecules 
that uh, your computer will analyze whether they fit one to each other and uh, whether you can make a drug out of it. So it's a very attractive uh, concept and there are of course already I mean, examples how you can make a drug using just virtual approach. But of course the real world efficacy it has to be yet demonstrated. So no drug that was developed only by virtual screening has yet reached the market. But this is really a future of uh, uh, drug development. Uh, when you find the molecule that uh, uh, binds to your target, this is only the first step. So most of the time, it's, uh, the molecule doesn't penetrate the cell very well. It doesn't go from your stomach into the bloodstream and doesn't reach the organ you want to treat. So you have to optimize it in many different ways, trying to add different chemical groups, trying to make it more soluble, try to make, increase the permeability of, uh, of this drug into the cell. Uh, it's a very kind of multi-stage process. So you try, 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 you modify it, you try to make it as perfect as possible, but how it's, sh it's shown in this cartoon, sometimes it doesn't go well. So you may try to optimize it too much, and then you have a molecule that uh, um, doesn't dissolve or doesn't penetrate uh, the cell membrane. So it's a multi-stage iterative process that usually takes a few years. Uh, the new generation of small molecules is so-called targeted drugs. What does it mean? Before, as we saw, aspirin or those cytotoxic drugs, they were, I mean, developed just because they act in a certain way on a patient or on a cell. Uh, these days, we know the molecule, the mutation we want to target. We know uh, how exactly this molecule should uh, interact with the particular protein in the cell. So we can prepare, as I show you, as, as I show you, uh, a very specific uh, molecule that interacts only with a certain protein in the body. This minimizes side effects of your therapy and increases efficacy. There are multiple targeted drugs that are developed right now. The first one of them was actually uh, the uh, Gleviac. The Gleviac that. Uh, uh, is, treat, is used to treat the chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, a disease that was actually fatal before 2000. And all patients who developed this type of leukemia ultimately died within a few years. This was the first miracle drug that actually completely changed in the course of disease. And patients can live for many years or even decades uh, while having a therapy with this product without any major side effects. So this was the uh, start of uh, targeted drugs in oncology, and now dozens of uh, drugs are approved for, to treat different oncology diseases linked to specific mutations in the tumor. And they have a huge efficacy. So like you see here in lung cancer, you have now uh, drugs that if they are given to a certain patient with a certain mutation, they increase their lifespan dramatically, being kind of order of magnitude more effective than uh, standard chemotherapy. The only thing you have to do is to test the tumor for certain genetic mutations and select the right drug from the uh, large assortment of targeted therapies that are available right now. And then let's go to the monoclonal antibodies. This is another class of the drugs which is called recombinant proteins. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are actually similar to those antibodies that we, our immune system develops to fight with infectious diseases. So there are billions and billions of different types of, mo of antibodies in our body that are circulating in the blood and they are made by the nature in such a way that they can uh, bind specifically to a certain virus or bacteria and block them. So actually you can genetically engineer the so-called variable fragment of monoclonal antibody to enable its binding to any target, any protein target that circulates in the body. It can be a tumor cell, a tumor cell specific antigen, tumor cell specific protein uh, that you can uh, target specifically and destroy the tumor cells. Or it can be some kind of protein cytokine uh, linked to inflammation that uh, uh, is increased in your body and by blocking the cytokine you decrease the uh, inflammation and uh, treat the disease. 
So these monoclonal antibodies right now are used with, a, uh, are developed with a variety of techniques. So actually this is, these are pictures from our lab. So we are using LAMAS actually. LAMAS make antibodies that are in a way similar to humans and uh, much more similar than uh, murine antibodies and have uh, multiple uh, uh, beneficial uh, characteristics that enable uh, to make a very good mono therapeutic monoclonal antibodies from them. So you immunize your llama with uh, the target of interest. So you uh, select antibodies from the animal and choose those that are, li that are, for example, target specifically the tumor type that you want to treat. And then you humanize them, make them more like human antibodies and make a drug out of them. And these drugs, they have really tremendous efficacy. So these are uh, examples of the drug that uh, I've made for treatment of psoriasis. Uh, these are results of the phase three clinical trials that we've conducted. Here is the patient with severe psoriasis with almost all its body covered in lesions. So just within four uh, months, three months after administration of the first dose of antibody, the patient is almost healthy and this effect really persists. Another example of uh, the breakthrough made with monoclonal antibody drugs is again cancer. So even with the success of the targeted drugs uh, that I've shown you, uh, there is a problem of resistance. So a tumor cell adapt to uh, a dr targeted drug, it mutates and it becomes resistant and grows again. So the only way to control this tumor for a long, for a long period of time is to teach or force your immune system to control the tumor. And actually, uh, this is what our immune system does every day. A every day, there are tumor cells arising in our bodies, and our immune system is very well trained to find out, to find those tumor cells and destroy them. And only in a very rare, on a very rare occasions, uh, tumor can develop and avoid uh, immune system. It develops certain uh, uh, displays certain antigens, certain proteins that actually uh, make them, make tumor cells invisible for the immune system. So what you can do, you can develop monoclonal antibodies that block those proteins on the surface of the tumor cells that make them invisible and you make them visible for the immune system again. So you kind of open eyes of, your, of the immune system of the patient and force the immune system of the patient to find the tumor and destroy it. And this is the class of uh, drugs that is called checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, they appeared first time about 10 years ago uh, and they are now the standard of treatment of many malignancies and they drastically improved the results of uh, the therapy for many indications. So here again, an example of uh, the drug that uh, we've developed. Uh, this is, these are patients with metastatic melanoma. You know what melanoma is. Uh, a very severe disease It was you know, not, not long ago. Uh, and actually patients with metastatic melanoma, very few of them survived more than two years. Currently with the checkpoint inhibitors, you have more than 70% of patients alive for a prolonged period of time. So this is really a uh, life-saving class of drugs. And then probably you've heard about CAR-T therapy. So in many cases, I mean, the immune system of the patient is too weak or the tumor cell is too smart and it avoids actually the uh, immune system anyway. So how you can deal with that? You can take immune, immune cells of the patient from the body and you can genetically modify them to express a specific protein, a receptor that actually uh, recognizes the tumor cell very well. And actually you transform billions of patients' immune cells into a very effective killers who hunt down for tumor cells, find them and destroy them. This is a very complicated but very effective uh, treatment for many hematological cancers, which also made a huge difference uh, for those patients that do not respond uh, to traditional uh, uh, therapeutic approaches to lymphoma and leukemia. And then of course, gene therapy. Probably you've heard that uh, within the last few years, there is a search 
of uh, new uh, of genetic therapies. You can actually, using viral vectors, deliver a, a certain gene into the human body uh, that has a mutation and doesn't function very well in a patient and replace or actually put in place uh, in a certain organ and certain tissue a working gene that actually synthesizes the protein and compensate the deficiency that was caused by the inherited mutation. Uh, alternatively, you can take out patients, uh, patient cells from the blood, genetically modify them, for example, to express protein that is absent in the body and return them back into the patient to allow them to synthesize this protein and uh, compensate the genetic defect. Uh, you can do it with a variety of different viruses. These can be so-called adeno-associated viruses, which are used right now. Examples are Luxturna, which is uh, approved for treatment of uh, inherited blindness, and it actually helps patients who completely lost their vision to restore uh, vision, at least for some extent. And a breakthrough drug, which is called Zongensma, uh, which is used for treatment of spinal muscle, mu muscle atrophy a very severe neuromuscular uh, diseases that actually in severe cases leads to the death of a child within a uh, couple of years after the birth. So by delivering a working gene into the child, you can save the life of the, of the child. And uh, at, until now, we have examples of uh, children living for several years and being almost healthy with the disease that would ultimately kill them just a few years ago before this treatment was invented. And of course, there are uh, other ways to deliver vectors such as lentiviral or retroviral vectors that are used, for example, for CAR T cells. When you uh, construct your viral vector in a way, once again, a Lego construct, construct uh, works from different pieces, you can put it into the uh, bioreactor, which produces billions and billions of viral particles that are then used uh, as a product that will be delivered to the patient. This is a very well characterized uh, uh, biotechnology process now. And I know that in Portugal as well, there are companies that are developing this type of medicines. In my opinion, within 10 or 15 years, that will, this will become a mainstream therapy in a way small molecules and monoclonal antibodies our mainstream therapies right now. Uh, and uh, I also brief, uh, will briefly describe the, what goes next. So we've uh, spent half an hour talking about different types of drugs and how they are discovered. But this is only the first and actually a minor uh, stage in drug development. It takes usually a couple of years out of 10 more that are required to make the drug. And it only costs you know, a few percent of the total budget of drug development. So what is the rest? When you prepared your prototype product, uh, the product, the molecule, or the genetic vector that will be delivered to a patient, you have to go through a very, very complicated path of so-called pharmaceutical development. So you have to test this uh, product in a number of complicated physical chemical assays, uh, proving that it's stable, proving that it's not, doesn't degrade uh, when you uh, store it, for example, at a room temperature, or you shake it. Uh, you have to characterize uh, the purity of this product and develop special methods to control its quality, to ensure that when it will be in industrial production, the quality of this product from batch to batch will be the same, and all patients will be, uh, I mean, benefit from this drug and it will be not causing unexpected adverse events linked to the quality of the drug. And then non-clinical studies. Uh, we've talked about the thalidomide and uh, sulfanilamide strategies. The result of it are complicated programs of uh, non-clinical testing in small animals and in many cases in non-human primates that are necessary to ensure that the, the drug is indeed safe and can be used in a broader patient population. And clinical development. So you know, previously it was very simple. So you have to start with phase one clinical trial, uh, 
testing your drug in a number of uh, healthy volunteers just to show that it's safe in different doses and then demonstrate how it uh, behaves in the human body. Then you proceed to the phase two clinical studies on a limited number of patients where you test different dosing regimens of the drug and show whether the drug really works, whether it's uh, effective. And only then you go into the so-called phase three clinical studies, a large clinical studies that uh, uh, recruit hundreds and thousands of patients, and where you, where you compare your drug to a comparator, to active drug, a standard of treatment, and you have to show that your novel drug is at least as safe than the uh, comparator and is more effective. And these so-called phased clinical development uh, usually takes at least six to seven years. So what we saw during pandemics is that actually if there is an urgent medical need and if you really have to bring a life-saving product to the population as soon as possible, you can find smart ways to decrease the program of, to shorten the program of clinical development without risking uh, patients' health. So this new paradigm actually combines different phases of development. You start to uh, test your drug for efficacy and safety in small patient populations as soon as possible. And if you see a pronounced therapeutic effect uh, or very good degree of protection in case of vaccine, then you can gradually add new patient cohorts, new patient groups in order to be sure that uh, the, the product is safe and effective. And at the same time, you can put it onto the market at first for a very limited patient population to decrease risks. And then as soon as you have more and more data that the drug is safe and effective, you can broaden the patient population and serve more uh, patients. So actually, this paradigm is not only applicable in case of vaccines for emerging diseases, but it also now been used uh, for novel cancer drugs with uh, pronounced efficacy for those tumor types that are not yet uh, treated very well. So uh, there are, of course, new challenges ahead. So COVID-19 was probably uh, only one of those uh, pandemic threats that await us within uh, years to come. But there will be new viral infections and uh, researchers and hopefully you as uh, young promising researchers will contribute to development of new vaccines, new antiviral medicines that will uh, be used with uh, emerging infectious diseases. There is a huge problem right now with drug resistant bacteria. You know, antibiotics saved millions of tens of millions of lives within last century. But unfortunately, the uncontrolled use or poorly controlled use of antibiotics leads to spread of so-called antibiotic resistant bacteria. Bacteria that cannot already, treated be, uh, cannot already be treated with uh, uh, antibiotics. They uh, have genetic changes that make them resistant, that make them uh, able to overcome antibiotic treatment. And this is very dangerous. I mean, it's forecasted that uh, within 10 years, the threat from drug resistant bacteria from hospital infections will be much uh, worse than the threat from uh, emerging viral infections. And the burden on the healthcare will actually exceed maybe cardiovascular and oncology diseases. So the development of new approaches to treat these superbugs, the drug resistant bacteria, is a task that uh, actually probably one of priority tasks for, for your generation as well. And of course, there is a everlasting fight with cancer. So there was a huge progress made with uh, uh, treatment of cancer within the last few years, but still there are many tumors that are very hard to treat and pancreatic cancer of, is one of them. And I was really uh, pleased to see that uh, one of the recently built uh, research centers here in Lisbon is actually dedicated to uh, fight with pancreatic cancer, which is actually one of the worst uh, cancer killers uh, currently. And uh, of course, there are many and many discoveries that are awaiting you uh, in the fight with cancer. And then probably aging. 
So right now there is an ample evidence that you can actually have an impact, influence the processes, the biochemical, the cellular processes that are uh, linked to aging and by developing medicines that uh, actually target those pathways uh, leading to cellular aging. Of course, you, you will not make people immortal, not at all, but you can prolong the healthy uh, life uh, to extent of 100 to 120 years and uh, make the quality of life of uh, older generation much better. So probably this is also one of those huge tasks that await the scientific society and you as uh, uh, new young researchers within the next 10 to 20 years. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much once again.